to the Paducah School of Art and Design for having me here today. Um, it's a pleasure. I love this gallery space. Um, Y'all are super lucky. Um, and so I am Danielle Mujina. I'm here to talk about my series, um, Pink Apocalypse. Um, you've got in Red Weather, Pink Weather, a selection from a much bigger series that you can also see online. My artist's website is at the end. Um, the figurative paintings in the Pink Apocalypse series and in this exhibition start a conversation about gender performance, place, and crisis. And I'm really trying to ask questions about how both individuals and groups of win women kind of interface with looming threats or changes in their immediate environments. Um, and speaking of immediate environments, um, I am originally from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and in Cleveland, we've got this like really long stretch of cultural gardens where countries from all over the world have like their own dedicated little area with sculptures and like like uh, flora from that region. Um, and this is an image of my dad and I at the one for Croatia, where my family emigrated from. Um, and the inscription on the statue says, dedicated to all of the immigrant mothers who brought their families to America, seeking freedom and a new life. Um, and this is my grandmother who emigrated to the U.S. from Croatia, um, and we're super close. Uh, I grew up with my grandparents as sort of co-parents uh, because not only were my parents still in school, um, but also that's pretty common in a lot of Slavic families to sort of um, have kind of strong co-parenting like that. And um, my grandmother and I happen to be super, super close, and. Um, I right now am wearing a dress of hers from the 60s and um, she passes a lot of her clothes down to me. Um, we're both like observably super, super femme, like, like super um, girly things. We have really similar mannerisms and kind of like softer ways of speaking. Um, and sometimes, you know, that makes me think about the ways that we emulate role models in our lives um, for in positive ways um, and also pick up on maybe other things that are a little bit more maladaptive as well. Um, but uh, I think that it is also interesting to ask yourself like, well, how much of this pattern that I am repeating through my kind of um, mannerisms, ways of speaking, the way I move through the world are really me? Um, and how much of it is sort of like a gender-based performance that we're sort of conforming to a little bit. Um, and it's, it's interesting to ask those kinds of questions. So, you know, we share like a similar frame, like I'm able to like, you know, have all of her clothes. And um, the third picture I really like too, because um, I share things with her as well. That's my favorite red lipstick, uh, Ruby Wu. <laughs> Uh, and she tried it on and she's super excited. Uh, so that it kind of goes back and forth and we have like an ongoing conversation about some of these things. Um, others we don't really talk about, um, especially some of those things that are harder. So the, I'm showing a couple of older works just to contextualize maybe like where this work is coming from and sort of how it came to be. Um, and the bottom I've got a series of paintings of someone making eggs. Um, and so if you look at the sequential series, there's seven paintings sort of across time. Um, and what do you notice happening as the series progresses? Like, is there anything out of the ordinary happening here? You're dipping your fingers into the food? Yeah, and so, you know, sometimes that could be normal, like you're breading some chicken or something like that, right? Um, but, you know, it seems a little bit more intense than that. Like, if I'm going to beat eggs, I'm probably going to use a whisk and not my bare hands, right? Um, and so emotionally, uh, how does it feel, right, that there's, it starts off sort of normal, um, going through the process of breaking up all these eggs as if you're going to serve a meal to, like, a bunch of people, right? And then there's this, like, angst. In the end of the series, you're left with just uh, the whisk inside of the bowl of mixed eggs. Um, and there's pattern that kind of proliferates the entire space. Um, who's had somebody prepare them food before? 
Okay, how often do you think about like what the mental state of somebody that is um, performing acts of care for you? Like how often were you like, well, like my mom or my dad made me this meal. I wonder if they were okay, like while they were performing this task for me, right? Um, I wonder like what if they were, if they really had the capacity to do that at the moment um, or if they were just kind of going through the motions to please everyone around them, right? Um, and so some parts of the things that my grandmother um, and I share um, are really amazing things. Like I consider myself a really good teacher in the ways that I'm kind of nurturing, but also it can act to my detriment when I can be sort of like self-effacing and like people pleasing, right? Um, and so working on that assertiveness and not sort of like also hiding, not feeling well. Um, because I've not only inherited some of those surface things, but my grandmother and I also share um, a pretty serious mental illness. Um, and for women, a lot of the times um, when somebody is exhibiting like a super emotional state, you're like, well, she's like hysterical, she's unreliable, right? And so I put a lot of energy into just like coming off normal, right? And being like, I'm ready to make you eggs and perform as you want me to, right? And that's like not okay. Like that really hurts inside sometimes. Um, and so that's, that's one of those things where, you know, you might inherit some maladaptive behaviors, um, but it's not my grandmother's fault, right? It's not my fault. There's a lot of ways that gender kind of, and expectations for gender permeate everything. Um, and that also changes depending on place, depending on family, depending on you. Um, and so these are images of my grandmother uh, before and after emigration. Um, the photo on the left-hand side is her in a displaced persons camp in Italy before coming to the U.S. And um, the image on the right is her after immigrating. Um, and she's got like the classic beehive hairstyle. She's like gone bright, bleach blonde, um, and just like trying to sort of like fit in um, and trying to like make friends and figure out how to navigate this new place and like be as like normal as possible. Um, and so on the surface, it's like all glitz and glam, but there's like also this feeling of like restraint because something also you notice between the two images is like, she's also lost like a lot of weight. Um, after emigration, kind of trying to conform to like body standards in the 60s um, as well. So some of my older works really explore this echoing and like um, learned patterns of behaviors within a family and within our broader kind of culture um, in domestic settings. And so in a lot of those works too, my grandmother's in the act of passing to me like a dress, which is something that she does a lot. Like she's always trying to give me her stuff. Um, and a lot of the things that our moms and grandmothers and whoever give to us are given to us in good spirit um, to help us um, and to give us joy and to just share the knowledge that you know, we have. But they can also convey pressures as well. Um, when we take that dress or we take that behavior um, or lesson and try to put it on, sometimes it doesn't fit right um, with who we are. And um, you know, for me too, like living uh, with a lot more privilege than my grandmother did, having access to mental health care, um, and also with a little bit of difference in that I am queer. Um, some of the things that I put on are like, you know, positive uh, and did fit. And I do love like playing with gendered tropes and like dressing up super femme like I am today. Um, but other things didn't quite jive with me as well. And so there's this like restraint in the images or doubling of myself and my grandmother in these works. Um, and you know, I really just think about the way that for a lot of us, like the, our gendered behaviors uh, are really determined for us super early. Uh, like on the left here, this is an image of me playing with a Christmas gift uh, that was given to me as a child, which essentially is just a hole. <laughs> It's essentially a hole like it's just a laundry made of plastic and I'm like okay like this is supposed to be fun right um, and like through the tie you can kind of see uh, my mom putting laundry away my dad's getting laundry out um, and you know what do, what kind of message does that send to little girls about what you're supposed to want to do or consider fun um, I did put a lot of Beanie Babies in there, so that was that was a good thing about this toy. It was like a storage situation. Um, but then the image on the right-hand side, um, 
you know, it really feels like this little girl is like kind of trapped in this pattern space. Pattern is like emanating from this bassinet in the room. Um, it's something that she's going to breathe in inevitably. Um, things that might bring her immense joy and also things that might deny her of herself and also patterns from all around us that can be really toxic and harmful. Um, the, the violence uh, and abuse that a lot of women face um, in a lot of different ways. Um, and that brings me to kind of the impetus for this body of work. Um, in 2019, I was already living in Kentucky. I used to teach at Murray State. And um, so I moved in 2017. And uh, the one thing that I started first thinking about was um, how much open space there is, right? Like as a person from a primarily urban environment, I was like, oh my gosh, I feel so exposed. Like, I don't know where the closest this or that is. Um, or I just have like a bodily feeling of being like unsafe because there's so much around me. I'm like, where is this sort of coming from? Um, and, you know, I'm a survivor. And so I do experience like some agoraphobia and fear of like really wide open spaces like, from trauma and kind of being like, oh gosh, like something's going to happen to me um, in an embodied way. Um, but when Dr. Blasey Ford test, gave her testimony um, against uh, Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh um, and the Me Too movement started picking up momentum, as I was also starting to think about um, not being at home in Cleveland in those domestic spaces with my family, but here on my own, alone, um, I became emboldened by her testimony to speak about my experiences as a survivor and also to think about what happens when you um, sort of interface with the precipice of your house and the rest of the world. Um, what happens when women are interfacing with immense change that their that's coming to their environments directly or indirectly or culturally. Um, and so you can see a lot of compositional similarities between that image and this painting here, um, where I'm sort of in between this boundary of logs that are chopped. It's uncertain like who has put the effort in to create this divide between me and this either real or imaginary like field of men in my environment. Um, there's like some considerable effort that's had to be done to create this distancing between these characters. Um, and yeah, so here, like, of really responding to that idea of agoraphobia um, and thinking about how I felt in that really wide environment. But this project of confronting trauma is super multifaceted, and these are um, just a couple of the things that I'll probably mention on and off throughout the presentation. Um, and I should also mention that this character of me in the Peter Pan collar dress on the left-hand side is a recurring character in a lot of the paintings who... Um, is sort of like this robotic version of me that's like performing femininity in a way that might be at her own detriment um, or like harmful to people around her in certain ways. So you'll see her appear. She's a sort of ambiguous character throughout the work. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to go through four main themes in the Pink Apocalypse series. So witnessing change, enduring wounds, imagined reckonings, and conjuring agency. This first section, witnessing change. So one of the one of the first things you notice, one of the first things I was thinking about in this work was, you know, there's something happening, right? Me too is sort of picking up momentum. Um, people are talking more openly about issues of gender equity in general, and um, beyond that, other reckonings that you know our country is facing. We can kind of sense that change is coming. We're like watching, waiting to see what's going to happen. But different people also respond to those things in different ways. Um, these two paintings, I think, show a good contrast where the one on the right-hand side, it's like this moment of change um, that's happening within the environment. This figure seems like she's like, oh, finally. Right, like the moment has come where I can speak my truth, maybe, you know. Um, and on the left hand side, you've got figures that seem sort of at odds with how much they want to acknowledge that the sky is bleeding, that there's like immense change or pain or conversation happening, where these two figures are like, yo, in our birdbath, the sky is falling into this. And this other figure is like, 
I don't really know if I want to acknowledge that any of this is going on, right? She's like, I don't, I don't want to know. Keep me out of it, right? And so in our families, too, with everything that's going on in our world, sometimes we're intergenerationally like at odds with each other, um, or it takes people different amounts of time to kind of come to something. Um, and so also I was working on this series during the pandemic and during our kind of climate crisis as well. So, you know, thinking about change also in like, my gosh, our world is like ever more dangerous, right? Um, things are happening to the land around us all the time that are pretty scary. Um, and, you know, in my previous work, I already had that pattern like floating towards the little girl, right? That she could breathe it in and absorb it. Um, and I'm sort of asking questions about, um, well, if I breathe in this cultural moment, um, is this something that is like gonna kind of change me, right? Is it something going around that is gonna help me? Or is this kind of pattern that echoes through the work um, something that is like a germ of harm? Is what's going through the atmosphere like a heightened pressure to kind of conform or fall back in line with what's expected of us? Um, and as we witness change, we have different reactions to that too. As we witness change, we have different ways that we're situated in the world. And so in the painting on the left, I was thinking about how as you watch change happen in an environment, despite you know difference in gender or race or ethnicity or sexuality, you might be watching something at the same time as a prompt for sort of conversation. Um, and kind of these two parallel trees show f are sort of like the figures growing alongside one, one another as they watch this. Um, and then the painting on the left too, as change happens, sometimes you gotta like prepare, right? You gotta be ready to fight. Um, you have to, be, you're like, oh God, what's gonna happen? In what ways do I need to um, kind of combat this oncoming threat? Um, but that can also kind of go too far, right? Um, you can sometimes when change is interfacing with you, you might hold so steadfast to protecting yourself that, you know, you might draw blood from yourself, right? So this figure is like holding this knife to her back as the sky becomes red. Um, but, you know, it's like the ulna of her hand is like so far twisted that it's kind of contorted. Or, you know, is that someone else's blood or is she drawing blood from her own back as she kind of protects herself? Um, and the kind of moment of change, the moment of like impetus to kind of talk about things that were under wraps, such as uh, the prevalence of, uh, you know, assault uh, in a lot of ways and trauma is something that the work is also sort of addressing. And one of the ambiguous things that happens in the environments is a lot of the figures in these paintings are suffering these strange wounds. Um, and as a survivor, you know, you carry trauma in your body forever. Um, it's sort of something that you're living with in a constant way, um, and you're still walking around like alive, right? Um, and so the figures in these paintings like maybe are protecting more vulnerable members um, of the community in different ways, but they also might be like blocking their agency, right? So this figure is sort of ambiguously inside and like behind these barred windows as the other two women are sentinels sort of outside. Um, in this section of the work, too, I'm also thinking about um, the idea of lobotomy and the idea of stigmata. Um, a lot of people like me were lobotomized, uh, right? So lobotomy being a now archaic surgical treatment for mental illness or sexual deviants or um, women who were considered too uh, out of line with what their families uh, or partners wanted. Um, yeah, like a lot of those lobotomies were performed on women and I think to myself, oh my gosh, if I was born 50 years ago or something like 50 years previous to when I was actually born, I could be like in an institution just like with part of my brain <laughs> removed and that's kind of scary. Um, but I'm also like moving through the world in this way that I'm also censoring myself a lot of the time. And so that comes up. I was also, as a Croatian, my family was also Roman Catholic. And um, there's this idea in Catholicism, especially with women saints, where um, if you um, have endured trauma or are 
suffering, sometimes like that makes you virtuous. Like you're like a saint after that. You're like, okay, well now this person who has evaded potential assault um, is now a saint because yay, they got away. Or um, this person is actively bleeding because they're so holy. Um, they're actively experiencing like the pain of Christ, but that makes them like good and virtuous. And so as a survivor too, um, I'm like, well, it makes me good and virtuous to like keep all of my pain under wraps, right? Um, it doesn't, right? But, so, but I'm still walking around with these like open wounds. Um, and so you'll see, oh, I didn't mention that there's this diamond pattern, um, which is a pretty like vaginal shape in general. Um, and in a lot of medieval manuscripts, um, the side wound of Jesus or the stigmata are also in diamond shapes like that. Um, and so that's one of the things that sort of draws me to that shape in general. Um, and, you know, just making an alignment with that and this painting in which two gloved hands are examining uh, my head, right, pulling my hair back to reveal this strange um, wound that's stapled or sutured and emanating a glow that may or may not be contagious. Uh, these figures have their hands gloved, right? Um, and so a lot of the time caring for survivors has been considered women's work, especially uh, survivors of sexual assault and thinking about that. Um, but also like when I open myself up, like in this talk right now, um, I'm like allowing myself to be like a scientific like data point um, under observation and that's kind of scary in some ways. Um, in this painting too, which is like right over here, there are sometimes ways in which this lobotomy that's happening is ambiguously good or bad or the figures aren't um, you can't tell if what's going on is consensual or not um, like is this pinkness being removed from my brain um, or is something in, in a positive way or a negative way um, and also sort of thinking about uh, a lot of the paintings where the figure bends strangely, um, thinking about the fawn response and the kind of like confrontation with stressful things that pressurizes me back into like super traditional femininity instead of like, uh, like the assertiveness that I've kind of learned through the years. Um, like if I'm scared, I tend to be like, okay, like what do you want me to do? Like how can I be better, right? Instead of like, no, that hurt me, right? Um, and so thinking about that kind of pressure and whether I'm, how much I'm doing it to myself versus not. Um, funny, funnily enough, like to get this reference photo, I'm like in my house with a gourd, like taking photos of myself in weird ways with like no blinds and my neighbors are like, who is this woman? What is she doing? Um, <laughs> and uh, with trauma and intergenerational kind of responses to that, um, you know, I've got this image on the left-hand side here where these two figures are looking, this other figure who seems to have lost her head, right? Like, haha, play on words, but um, they're like, why is she, like, freaking out? Like, why is she hysterical about this? Why is she making so much noise? Or um, what's going on here? Um, those sorts of responses from my family and talking about myself or my work is our present as well as, you know, in the professional world as well. Um, and, you know, here are some direct references to stigmata, um, some other images where it's like the figures are like allowing the apocalyptic magic uh, in the atmosphere to come towards them. And you're like, oh, my God, it just burned that tree. What's going to happen to this woman? Like, is she welcoming a power or is she like welcoming something that's taking her and taking agency away? Um, questions I sort of ask myself a lot. Uh, with these wounds, too, I've also played with them being in, multi in different areas of the body. So, you know, thinking about that pleaser, like, fawn response to a confrontation, it's like sometimes it's like I feel like I'm so scared that if I don't act the way that somebody expects me to act that I am putting myself at risk or, like, a detriment, right? And so sometimes it feels like it's taking away your voice or, like, sometimes it feels like your throat is going to close up. And so like, I think about what, is, what does that feel like in my body in the moment? Or sometimes when, I, when I'm like removing my whole personality to try to kind of conform to something, it's like, I feel like it's like a bullet through my head or who I really am um, is gone. And instead I'm just sort of like this shell. Um, and then as a, a more on a more obvious note, right? Like 
the idea of exposing like how trauma feels in the body, right? So I've got like this axe and the point of it is resting on my cervix, right? So the idea of being in an act of intimacy and um, sometimes things hurt or trigger things. Um, and you're like, how can I show this person like how this feels? Um, or like, how can I show this person that I'm like in maybe two places at once and really trying to stay present? Um, but yeah, like that, that painting I just finished like two weeks ago, but so that's why it's a studio shot. Um, another thing really common to a lot of survivors of lots of different kinds of trauma um, are like these imagined reckonings or like revenge fantasies, ideas of like, well, what if I could have done something different or what if I could get revenge? Um, and so a lot of the works also have that happening. Um, revenge fantasies can feel really good um, but they're not always the most productive, but it is kind of cathartic to imagine like in the work like, well, what if we could take justice into our own hands? Um, it's like a release, but when I see that, then it makes me ask larger questions. Um, a really iconic scene that feels really good to watch in terms of a revenge fantasy is this scene from Thelma and Louise. Um, and in this scene, Thelma and Louise um, are on the run from the law after Louise kills a man who sexually assaults Thelma, and the two women kind of confront a lewd cat call from a truck driver. It's a great movie. I really recommend it in all, on all fronts. Um, and Susan Strandon is like a queen. So, um, But it feels really good to be like, well, what if like that could happen? without repercussion, right? But it's not like realistic. In painting, um, different things can happen. Alternate realities can be suggested. So, you know, for example, I'm taking this um, image of uh, Susanna and the Elders, a historical kind of biblical story that has been done over and over again in art history where um, Susanna's bodily autonomy is being invaded. Um, and on the top image by Tintoretto, it's like, she's like, okay, this is chill. Tintoretto's a dude. Um, this is chill. Like, I'm just being observed. Like, people are, like, watching me in a way that I'm not consenting to. And I'm, like, not going to freak out. I don't feel scared. Um, and in the image on the bottom, uh, which is by Artemisia Gentileschi, who um, is, it's pretty reputable that she was also a survivor. Um, you know, it's a completely different take on the same story. Uh, and the figure seems really uncomfortable. Um, in my Susanna, I'm thinking about, okay, well, like, what if, like, when um, this happened to me, I was saved by, like, an army of bad bitches? right? <laughs> okay. And so like, what would that look like? Um, and asking questions like that. And I love Artemisia Gentileschi, um, her Judith and Maidservant series, uh, the collaboration between the two women um, to sever this head is like pretty awesome. Um, but I also like that there's like a lot of uncertainty and pausing and planning that goes on in the series. Um, and so you can kind of see some influence in some of the collaboration between figures in these ambiguous landscapes where figures maybe are like dissolving a body in acid or setting it on fire with mineral spirits. Um, <laughs> and in some of the paintings too, it's like the figure, the, the viewer is kind of confronted by the figures uh, in the painting. Like you're like, oh gosh, this figure's over me with a bat. What am I being held accountable for? To ask yourself that question or you know you also just don't really want to mess with someone's mom or someone's grandma you know like if you mess with their kid they're going to be pretty pissed so you're kind of like under the ground in this painting here um, or like what if it was so normal that when somebody like hurt women that little girls were like f off right like i'm not saying that violence should be answered with violence but how ridiculous that is kind of is also illustrative of like how infrequent it is that people actually are held accountable for um, behaviors big and small. Um, but also my aunt appears in a lot of these paintings and she's a nurse. She's in all three of these on the left hand side and she's seen some shit as a nurse, right? So she's always just like, whatever, right? And so in the pink apocalypse where everything's going to hell, she's also like so chill about it. And I love that vibe where other figures seem like a lot more fraught and like anxious as well. Um, or like this figure, like you're, you're sort of like the idea of like, well, what if I had the power to stop something else? Like, what if I had the power to intervene with somebody that um, maybe was causing issues in their community that I was maybe aware of? Like, what if I could just stop someone in their tracks? Um, or, you know, like, what if I felt like I could actually get through to someone with some sort of power? Um, 
my friend Liza at one point when I was making this series was like, dude, like, where are all the dudes in the paintings? And I was like, oh, that's a good point. And so I, um, I started kind of asking myself a few questions about that, um, thinking about people like um, in the top left painting, there's this sort of tension between the viewer and the figure in that painting where it's like uncertain trust, where it's like, are you like with me or are you not with me? Like, is this a safe interaction or not? Um, uh, or like just trying to bridge difference and collaborate at the same time. The figure on the right hand side, the idea of like, you know, um, lone cowboys drawing inward when all this, um, when, when a lot of change is happening or like threat to like a way of living or thinking is happening, maybe isolating oneself. Um, the idea of putting up like a blinder or putting up a filter so that you don't have to look at something so dead on. It's like an image of my dad like hanging something in the backyard. Um, and then I, I, I warped it strangely in my weird internal state. Or maybe figures are like fleeing. Maybe they know that they did something wrong or maybe they're running to help, right? Um, and so just kind of different ideas of like where these figures would be and why. Um, and sometimes the imagined reckonings in these paintings take place between myself and myself. Um, and in this painting, you, um, which is over here on this back wall, make, make sure you take a look at it. Um, you are interfacing with this like giant Danielle in the like, you know, little outfit who is standing in front of what looks like a giant McMansion with all the dudes, my dad holding like a baseball bat in front of this house. She's sort of like both a victim and a monster here. She's like straddling this divide between the figures in the foreground and like the privilege in the background of like behaving as like this giant um, trope of like behaving in line with how she's supposed to behave. Um, but by falling in line with a lot of those standards, um, sometimes you're causing harm to other people. Um, uh, sometimes when I talk to my students about deviating um, from an expected behavior norm, I think I say to myself, well, like if you want to go this far off of a straight line, um, think about how much that helps somebody that wants to go like that far off of that straight line, right? Um, and so the idea of like, me not trying to like lean into the performing um, like white hetero femininity in ways that hurt people around me and myself um, is something I'm kind of thinking about in this painting. Like I'm the one that is in the middle of this field having this conversation with myself, watching myself kind of cause destruction in the landscape. Um, how do you take accountability for the ways that you can be the problem, even if it's to protect yourself? Um, and then also like, you know, looking at the two Fridas or two different aspects of Frida Kahlo are kind of coming together. Um, I've got like my like big daddy energy Danielle with the baseball bat um, and the Danielle in the Peter Pan collar dress and her babushka coming together to confront someone. So sometimes like the paintings, uh, the different parts of me feels like they're kind of coming to more of an understanding and maybe can be put towards the same effort uh, and action. Um, this section is conjuring agency. So with all of that being said, um, the past three sections of witnessing change, um, enduring wounds, and imagined reckonings, like how do you also move forward? Like what ways of like kind of growth is there beyond just like um, beyond what I've mentioned so far, just like confrontations. Um, a lot of it is like me hoping that I can have the power to like cast a clearing of the air, cast like a protective spell for um, my family or the people around me, right? Like a lot of the times you're just like, I just wish I could make sure that everybody around me is okay. Like, what does that look like? Can I make a figure who has this sort of like witchy power to do that from afar? Um, which also is, I guess, like, uh, metaphor also for painting and making these paintings. Sometimes like taking agency means being willing to burn everything to the ground um, or destroy it in order to build something else. Um, sometimes conjuring agency means recognizing the other people in your lineage that you directly impact. I have a stepsister who is much younger than me. She just turned 16 um, and thinking about, you know, what is it like? How do I be the best person that I can to demonstrate to Jenna as she develops her own brand of like womanhood and femininity that she can harness 
like the kind of magic of that in whatever way she wants. Like she's sort of like pulling this first diamond. Um, but you know, my grandmother and I are like, oh, like I hope everything is okay in the world. Like I hope that this is maybe a power that's growing and not a threat um, in this tree. And then also thinking about the ways that I've been prepared to take on the world by um, like my mom and my grandmother and the women around me, my chosen family. Um, you know, the idea too of that being a lot of pressure that can be annoying as well, right? So you're leaving the house and someone adjusts your collar and you're like, mom, stop, I look great. Um, or like, I got this, uh, leave me alone, I, I have it. Uh, and that can feel meddlesome, but it's also like a gesture of like care as well. Um, that also happens despite difference. Uh, sometimes agency means trying to figure out what actually is going on and um, like who's helping and who's not, who's included and who's not in a conversation or in an endeavor. Um, in this painting, the, the figures in the background who are welcoming the um, Peter Pan collar Danielle's into the environment, um, you're like, are they protecting this problem from getting worse? Are they inviting this energy into the world? And there's definitely a separation between that group of people um, and the Sentinels standing guard and me in the foreground with this chain link fence. And you're sort of like, well, whose side is Danielle on? She's wearing a mask and the other people aren't masked. Is she worried that she's gonna, something's going to happen to her? Why is she looking back at me? What does she want me to do? Um, who's in alignment with who? Who's contributing to this problem and who's helping? Um, and also thinking about the ways that between our families, sometimes we have to have challenging conversations. Um, and sometimes we have to invite people around us to take part in like larger social action as well. Um, and another aspect of like of conjuring agency and being caught in all the middle of this is, you know, sometimes you're just like, well, a lot of stuff in our world right now is like going to hell and, you know, can we just enjoy ourselves and like exist, right? So, you know, my best friend Jordan and I, um, they got us these matching like ridiculous choker collars and we've got these on um, and I'm eating a pancake in my combat boots and uh, we're smoking a pink blunt as the world burns. And so it's also ambiguous if like, you know, this is, we're being kind of like burned at the stake um, as like, outspoken like queer individuals um, or like you know are we just we're like well this is the situation this is what we're going to do um, but the diamonds are sort of this like protective circle around those figures as well um, and so let's talk about two more that are in the gallery but uh, after I go through some of the influences I'm just going to go through them really quick and I'm not going to talk about all of them but just so that you can get some visuals here um, on this page I'd really love to point out Don Malore's uh, Death Army Dorothy series uh, in which she imagines a fictional world in which Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz becomes like a militant feminist and destroys all of Oz um, and <laughs> tries to figure out what to do to like uh, move through her world and they're very like tender and emotional paintings because sometimes it's like Dorothy's actions are positive and sometimes they're self-destructive um, and sometimes you know that happens with the rest of us as well. Um, I love Innes Reichlich's uh, self-portraits that have these strange relationships between the body um, and the figure uh, and they're all self-portraits like uh, they're just strangenesses there and uh, I'm a big fan of the kind of like performative like violence in Janine Antoni's work as well as um, thinking about a lot of the themes within my work of like that like passivity being really exaggerated in that Kiki Smith piece um, and then you know thinking about reckonings um, I'm, of course, a really big fan of Pipilati Wrist's Ever Is Overall, which also um, was an inspiration for Beyonce's uh, music video that you've seen where Beyonce is also like smashing stuff, just got good energy. And I actually think that one of the most important voices in art right now is Gisela McDaniel, um, who is an indigenous Chamorro uh, survivor artist who's making these paintings where um, figures are being painted with bodily autonomy after survivorship. But when you go up to the paintings, um, you can hear them tell their stories like if you're standing close enough um, it's really important work you should check it out um, and this also um, just like some selected theory and readings that um, I really love 
Um, and so the ones in the gallery, first I'm just going to move over here. You don't have to move yet. I'm just going to go up to this painting right here, okay? Um, and so this is one of my more recent paintings. Um, my friend and collaborator, Diane, and I, um, after the news about reproductive rights um, being threatened in Texas a while ago, um, we were trying to respond to how that made us feel in the landscape. And so I said to her like husband, our good friend Kevin, I was like, hey, do you want to be like the headless like force of the patriarchy invading our bodily autonomy? And he was like, yeah, sure, I'm chill with that. Um, and so um, we went into the cornfield in Murray, and um, it was like Kevin was sort of like acting as if he was sort of taking something from us, and we're sort of still trying to remain standing. Um, and Diane uh, was pregnant at the time, and she's had her baby. It's just, her baby is safe. Um, she had a scary pregnancy experience as well. Um, but just that being positioned like over the womb as well, um, and she's just like trying to maintain kind of like hold on that diamond and on that power um, as space is invaded. Um, I am wearing another one of my grandma's dresses that also happens to be the uh, colors of the Dallas Cowboys uh, as a secret between y'all and me. Um, but I really like enjoyed making this painting. I felt like, you know, sometimes when you teach painting, you can tighten up a lot uh, because you're teaching people how to paint. And I feel like I was so mad that um, the kind of like gestural force that came through the brushwork in this painting helped me like start loosening back up a little bit. Um, but yeah, like thinking about like how do we still remain standing as a lot of our rights are um, being threatened and how are you kind of called upon to help even if that doesn't directly impact you but impacts people around you. Um, and then we're gonna move to this painting on the back wall. So if everyone like wants to come with me for a sec. All right, so um, this painting took two years. Um, it's a triptych. It's like the biggest piece is the biggest that will fit in my car. You gotta think economically as an artist sometimes, uh, how you're gonna make something gargantuan but practical and affordable to cart around. Um, and in this, like, I think like one of the biggest things um, for me in conjuring agency and watching all of the kind of change in good ways and the kind of looming threats in other ways is just like the impulse of wanting to keep those close to me close um, and the idea of like having a safe haven and creating community um, and collaborating in endeavors to ensure one another's like well-being um, and to grow each other's power and agency and um, so you know I didn't realize that that was my uh, that that was my impetus when I started the painting. I just kept adding everyone that I, all of the women that were like really strong forces in my life into this painting. And then I went, oh, like this is like a self-protective mechanism in this moment of the pandemic where we're all sort of thinking about um, how to keep those close to you close, where we're thinking about, oh my gosh, so much is happening. What do I do? How do I prepare? Um, and also in the midst of lots of different reckonings going on in our country based on various aspects of identity. Um, also, what does leadership mean? What does it mean to like pass power or agency forward a generation or um, between people? Um, how do you listen? How do you show up? How do you ensure that everybody is okay? And, um, you know, again, like the painting uh, is like mostly women here, but um, Diane's son Ashin is here like witnessing this and um, is also like maybe like a beacon of hope for how to kind of dismantle like toxic masculinity and like issues like that in the future um, as well. And so yeah, like the pattern is raining down. We're just kind of there and collaborating and trying to figure out what to do. And I think that that is the most important thing that we can do right now and forever um, is like show up and work together um, in a lot of different ways. And so um, I'm gonna move back to the laptop to close out with a poem and then Q and A. Um, 
This is a selection from Adrian Rich's poem, Planetarium. Um, and I think it goes especially nicely with um, this painting in the center here. But also is like, if I didn't have to write an artist statement, then it would just be this. Um, I am bombarded, yet I stand. I've been standing all my life in the direct path of a battery of signals, the most accurately transmitted, most untranslatable language in the universe. I am a galactic cloud so deep, so involuted, that a light wave could take 15 years to travel through me, and has taken. I'm an instrument in the shape of a woman trying to translate pulsations into images for the relief of the body and the reconstruction of the mind. Mm -hmm.